In September 1978, a teenager hitchhiking through California narrowly avoided death after accepting a lift from a white, middle-aged man in a blue van. Whilst she would escape with her life, she would be left horrifically mutilated. Meanwhile, shortfalls in the criminal justice system would mean that after a short term behind bars, her attacker would be released, free to hunt another unsuspecting victim. This is what happens when the system fails to protect the public. This is the case of the mad chopper, Larry Singleton. And welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. New to this channel, are you? If you are, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday religiously. Crime and consistency is my theme tune, so join me then. Also, big thanks to all of you who are coming to see me on my UK tour. If you want to come see Serial Killer Next Door, then next year I am everywhere and I should be in America as well, but I'm definitely doing quite a big tour in America in 2024. So, if you fancy a bit of live entertainment and also get a big hug from me at the end, make sure you get yourself a ticket. Today's case is one a lot of you asked for. I am aware it's a historic one, but nonetheless, after researching it, it was really interesting to me because I have heard of this case, I've read of this case, but I really didn't know it. I just don't think a lot of documentaries and even written literature that's in public domain really goes into the depth that's required to really demonstrate what monsters people like Larry Singleton are. So let's start. The morning of the 29th of September 1978, we have a 15 year old Mary Vincent. Just think about that, she's 15. Look back at how you were when you were a kid. At the end of the day, at 15, you think you know everything, but you really know nothing and you're very vulnerable and often you're quite naive because you haven't learned on the whole that the world can be a really dark and nasty place. Of course, some individuals have by that point, but the majority of teenagers are just going about their business thinking that everything's going to be okay. She's hitchhiking in California. Remember, this is 78, so this is not unusual activity. And she was actually over 500 miles away from her home in Las Vegas, Nevada, which is a long way to be from home at that age. And she was making the 400 mile journey from Sequel to Corona. So Mary had grown up in Las Vegas. She was one of seven children, so it's a relatively big family. But again, in that time era, not big compared to how it would be considered today. She's a really promising dancer. And she'd actually performed at some really prestigious venues. So being front of stage at that age and being great at what you do, clearly we're looking at a young woman with an incredible life ahead of her. Also, unsurprisingly, her parents, they had jobs in Las Vegas in casinos. That's one of the major employers, isn't it, in that particular city? And like many teenagers, the reality was at 15, she's going through a really rebellious phase. I don't know about you guys, maybe you too will have had a rebellious phase. Some may think I may have had a rebellious phase. My brother doesn't think it ended. I don't think that's fair. I don't often go out anywhere these days, but catch me drift. At the end of the day, lots of us teenagers, we literally go through phases where it's surprising that anybody wants to talk to us and that our parents carry on feeding us and clothing us and putting a roof over our head. Now, her parents were really strict and one of the problems with that is you're living in a place like Las Vegas and there's so much accessibility, there are so many opportunities and you can grow up pretty quickly in a place like that. But then your parents, who are working in casinos, are actually really strict. So marrying those together might psychologically be quite difficult, and she did have problems with that. She began defying them. Her initial misbehavior started around things like wearing makeup when her parents didn't want her to. I started wearing makeup at 11, 
because Trisha Lowe gave me a black eyeliner. I blame her for this. Also, she was involved in truanting, she'd run away from school, she'd run away from home. So you can imagine that it would be quite scary for her parents, but also over time you get used to that. If you have a child that keeps running away from school and running away from home and then they come back safe, then understandably it's gonna over time desensitize you to the reality of that. There's actually a period of time where she lives with a boyfriend in his car for a year. I'm going to throw it out there now, if my child lived in a car for a year and she was under the age of consent, the guy better be ready for a tow truck to arrive to tow them, I don't know, directly to the police station. Just saying, just throwing it out there. Now this relationship ends after he gets arrested and he gets arrested for a really severe crime. Apparently he's alleged to have raped a high school girl and at this point Mary understandably decides to broaden her horizons and she decides that she wants to explore her neighbouring state. At this point she ends up living with her uncle in Salkal, which I would imagine with respect is something that would have given her parents a sense of peace at least they'd know where she was, that's in California. And after this brief time with her uncle, she moves on to head to Corona, California, which is where she intends to visit her grandfather. Now she'd hitchhiked before, but remember, we're talking she's very young, she's very naive, she's somebody who's lived in a car for a year, so she's not necessarily thinking about consequential behaviours and also she's not necessarily aware of individuals who may be more predatory because if you think about the relationship that she just left, if he was a rapist and he's hanging out with a young girl who's under the age of consent, then you can kind of imagine the kind of predators that can see vulnerabilities. So I would imagine that her vulnerabilities to those who are schooled in wishing to exploit likely could see those chinks in her armour really early on. But nonetheless, the day that she starts the hitchhike, she must have thought she was in luck because a blue van pulls over and it's in a place called Berkeley. And the driver just says, you know, get in. I'm actually gonna go to Reno. But yeah, sure, I can drop you off in Los Angeles. She accepts. Of course she does. She wants to get somewhere. This guy seems to know the area enough to tell her where he's heading, but also how he could drop her somewhere. And when she gets into that vehicle, not in her wildest imagination, her most horrific of nightmares could she have ever began to envisage where that journey would end for her. Now who picked her up was 50 year old merchant seaman, Lawrence Bernard Singleton, AKA Larry. Now at the time, what I would say is he was living in a relatively stressful experience psychologically. His life was on a spiral downward without doubt. He'd recently got divorced from his second wife and the relationship that he had with his daughter, that had broken down. So these are big stressors without a doubt. And it turns out that the attempts that he had with his daughter to discipline her had basically caused really vicious arguments between them and this had led to them becoming estranged. So arguably there's a lot of problematic dysfunction in his background. This is also taking place in symmetry with personal issues. So he's got a background of personal issues. He's got a serious drinking problem. And also he does have at this point a previous conviction for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Also, I suppose as is evidenced by the way that his daughter's responded to the way he's tried to discipline her, he's known to have a really volatile temper when drunk in particular. And let's just add another, I don't know, real positive to this type of human that I'm describing. He hated women. Yeah, just all of us. Just a woman, a female, anybody who looks like they may belong to the female race, despises them. Hmm, where have we heard of this before? Let's just think about it. Ed Kemp is a great example, isn't he? Now, as soon as Mary gets into the van and she's kind of been made to feel initially safe by this guy, she starts feeling that something's wrong. There's just something in the pit of her stomach and she thinks to herself, I'm not as comfortable as I thought I would be. First of all, Singleton becomes touchy-feely immediately. 
you know, this is an older guy. She's a 15 year old girl. She's vulnerable. She's naive. And she's also to some degree quite powerless. And he knows that. He's got her fully within his control. He's in the vehicle, he's driving. So he automatically feels that he has license to treat her how he wishes to treat her. And he becomes really touchy feely. And this is particularly noted to her when she lights a cigarette and she smokes the cigarette a little bit and it makes her sneeze. And he leans over, he puts his hand on her neck, asks her if she's sick and then pulls her towards him. And I have to say, I respect Mary a huge amount because a lot of us would just feel immediately terrified. A lot of us would be really concerned about what's gonna play out next. We would immediately suspect that something terrible might happen, but very often it would just remain in our heads. We might not say anything, act on it, and so on and so forth. But Mary does, she's like, do not touch me. And she pulls away from him, and then he seems, at least initially, to get the message. He's also at this point whilst driving, drinking out of a milk carton. One could say, looking after his calcium intake. If only that were so. If only we were talking about the dairy variety of dairy drinks. No, it's just spirits. It's just drinking alcohol directly from the milk carton that he's disguised as milk. Now at this point, she starts to go to sleep and she falls asleep. But when she awakes, she actually realizes that Singleton has turned the van around. And she realizes he's heading in the completely wrong direction. In fact, the opposite direction, they're heading back towards Nevada. Now, Mary at this point admits that she becomes very afraid and she actually sees a long pointed stick in the van and then she grabs it and she brandishes it at Singleton, which I just think is massively impressive. I really do, because she's letting him know, I'm not afraid to use this. You try and take me somewhere that I shouldn't be going, and you're gonna end up with, a, I don't know, this pointy stick fitting into an area you wouldn't quite fancy. So at this point, she's got the stick. She says to him, turn the vehicle around, and in response, Singleton's like, oh yeah, gosh, sorry, made a mistake, I'm not gonna hurt you literally just got it wrong. It was one of those honest scenarios. I didn't realize I was going in the wrong direction. Oh my God, at this point, how I wish that Mary had decided that in spite of him suggesting that everything was all right, that she just decided to go, I don't know, full impaler on him. I think we would have all been accepting of such actions. But of course she's young. She thinks she's got it wrong. He's taken her somewhere after all. He's doing her a favor. So when he calms her down, when he reassures her that everything's gonna be all right, then she relaxes, she lowers her guard, and then they carry on traveling. There's nothing at that point that indicates something terrifying, nightmarish, and life-changing is gonna occur. He lets her relax into this, remember. It's an important part of manipulation. He's seen that on a few occasions, she's letting him know, you may think you have power over me, but you just try it, sunshine. You just try it and you're gonna find that I retaliate. And she's young and she's fit and she's nimble. So these are good reasons why if you're a predator, you're not gonna want to enable that person to have the upper hand. If you can remove that fear, lower their concerns and wait it out, then they're gonna stop buying into a bias that maybe they got you wrong. Maybe I was a little bit impetuous. Maybe I was a little bit unfair. And that's what he does. He lulls her into a belief system that he's just a weird guy, yeah, but not a bad guy. We get to later on, it's around sunset. At this point, Singleton pulls off the highway, goes down a deserted road towards a canyon. He says he needs to use the bathroom. So he stops the vehicle and Mary at this moment in time takes advantage of that as well. She goes to relieve herself. She wants to stretch her legs as well. When you've been traveling a long time, exactly what you want to do, get your back sorted, let your legs just kind of stretch it out. And then as she bends down to just do the most innocent of motions and actions, she just ties her shoelace. Singleton just goes absolutely crazy. And he launches this totally unprovoked attack. He punches her, he strikes her repeatedly on the back of the head, he knocks her to the ground. 
and then hours and hours of violent sexual assault begins. Then he forces her into the back of the van, makes her perform oral sex on him, threatens to kill her if she doesn't comply. And then he really takes advantage of her. He binds her hands behind her back. He tears her clothes off. He rapes her again. He tells her to be quiet. He says he'll kill her. Then after assaulting her, he climbs into the front seat naked and just continues driving. You can just imagine, can't you, where this has gone for her. All those fears that she felt potentially had no foundation are playing out in violent technicolor before her. After he's got in the front seat and started to drive, he then stops the vehicle just a few miles further down the deserted road. And at this point, he's not finished with her. He's not finished with Mary. So he gets her to drink alcohol and he says, look, if you don't drink this alcohol, I'm gonna kill you. But he says, you know what though? If you do drink it, I'll set you free. And we all know, don't we? Serial killers in particular, that's the way they disarm you. It'll all be okay if. It'll all be okay when. And the truth is that that's how they get you to be within their full control. Because all you want to do is survive. You've been through the most traumatic experience already and suddenly the carrot is being dangled in front of you. The possibility of that freedom, it's too tantalizing for so many to ignore. So she does it. She starts to feel woozy. She's 15, remember? She starts to feel disorientated. And now he's got her, hasn't he? She's completely at his mercy. She gets raped by him. She's sodomized by him. Mary is ultimately at his leisure and pleasure in the most dark and malevolent of ways. She ultimately passes out. And then when she finally comes round, no doubt she's in a place where she's thinking, my God, I'm still alive. My God. Please let this be over, please let this be over, but wow. She could not have been further from the truth. Even worse was to come, in fact, and it's worse not just because of what she has to endure during the attack, it's worse because of how it alters her life forever. And I'm not just talking about the trauma psychologically, listen, what she's been through is enough to change anybody's life forever. It's about what happens to her physically. So, she comes around and Singleton's dragging her. She's naked. He's taking her from the van. He makes her lie by the side of the road and she's just begging, please set me free. And in response, Singleton replies, you want to be set free? Now I want you to think about that statement that I've just said, you want to be set free? He then went back to the van. He rummages around in the back and he returns with a hatchet. And he screams at her, I'll set you free. And then he literally begins to hack through her right forearm below the elbow. Takes three blows and he severs the limb. And Mary is obviously screaming. Imagine somebody removing your limb. No anesthetic. You're dealing with the adrenaline and trauma of what you've been through. How has this day where you were just meant to be hitching a ride changed so dramatically? And then it's not enough. No, he turns his attention to the left arm, severs it below the elbow with just two blows from the hatchet. Now, investigators believe that the reason that he did that was because he wanted to remove any evidence of fingerprints. So when the body was found, they wouldn't be able to trace the actual individual who'd been murdered. But even this isn't enough. No, no, no. Singleton then takes this critically injured Mary and just throws her down a 30-foot embankment into the Del Puerto Canyon. He then climbs down after her, and you can imagine that this is a young girl whose life has just changed dramatically, and she's looking at certain death, no doubt, in her mind. And is this enough? Is this enough for him to leave her alone? No. He climbs down after her, and then he stuffs her into a concrete drainage pipe. And he tells her, okay, now you're free. And he leaves her to die, naked, alone, profusely bleeding. And the reason I believe he says, okay, now you're free, is that when she asked to be free, he had that God complex, didn't he? 
much like Ted Bundy, who used to have that sense of being like a god when he just took the life from those women. It was intoxicating for him. That in that moment, he, as far as he was concerned, was so powerful. He could take life. It's exactly the same in this scenario. I think he's letting her know, you'll be free, but only in a way that I decide in this case, meaning that he's going to kill her. What is incredible about this 15-year-old girl who had intuition, almost protected herself in a way where she could have walked away from this if he hadn't managed to cajole her and coerce her into believing that she was safe. Incredibly though, Mary doesn't die. And when she comes round from that horrific attack, no doubt noting the fact that she has no arms now, half of her arms have been removed, dealing with that utter terror, trauma, the reality and shock. She doesn't lie there waiting for somebody to come and save her. She knows the only way that she's going to get through this if she saves herself. She sticks the stumps of her severed limbs into the mud because she realises she's got to try to stem the bleeding to some degree and then she just starts to stagger miles through the culvert. She's holding her mutilated arms up in the air because she knows that that's the way to reduce the bleeding because when you're bleeding, every heart's pump, it bleeds out. And if you're holding your arms down, it bleeds out. If you hold it up, then you can reduce that loss. How incredible is she? And the other reason that she's doing it is because the muscles of her arm are literally slipping out. She just has this instinct, what she's got to do. Somehow, she managed to walk over three miles and she did it by following the sound of traffic. Just following the sound of something familiar that means there's a road. All she concentrated on was the sound of that moving traffic knowing that that was the thing that could save her. But it's not enough that she's just listening and walking because there's more to do. She manages to pull herself back up the cliffside. This is a young girl. She's had her arms removed. Her arm muscle is hanging out and she's climbing up a cliffside and she gets there. When she reaches the road, she tries to flag down a vehicle. You know what? The first vehicle didn't stop. And I tell you what, I hope whoever you are, I hope whoever didn't stop in that vehicle, I hope it haunts you. I hope you're haunted by your lack of compassion, your lack of morality, your lack of care for this child, because she is a child. Yes, she might have looked scary. She was naked, she was mutilated, she was covered in blood, but my God, why wouldn't that be the motivating factor in pulling over? Thankfully, it didn't continue because the next car did stop. It's driven by a couple on vacation. And Mary, barely conscious, she manages to tell them, he raped me. The couple wrapped her arms in towels and they got a medical help. Thank God that they were passing. Thank God they had the moral compass, the care. Thank God they had the social need to reach into the world where a child was struggling and suffering and to take her from that place to help her. Now, as you imagine, Mary was in a really bad state. She undergoes emergency surgery and they actually used pieces of her leg to actually rebuild those destroyed arms, which is incredible. Now, this ultimately does actually allow for prosthetics to be fitted because that's important to know, you know, when somebody has a limb loss like that, certainly back in the time frame that we're talking, it's not as simple as being given a prosthetic limb. Things have to fit appropriately. So it's amazing that the doctors decide that they're going to rebuild her arms to a point where they can do that. But she has her dream stolen because... She was going to be a dancer. She had a natural talent, a natural gravity, proclivity for it. And that was stolen. She could never be a dancer. She ended up remaining in hospital for a full month and she faced years of physical and mental trauma because of that horrific ordeal. Like I said, listen, mental scars are always profound and sometimes they're so difficult because people can't see them. So you're walking around with these maiming experiences mentally, but nobody notices it. But with respect, 
when you have those feelings anyway because of the trauma that you've been through and then you've lost the ability to use your hands because they're no longer there and you've dealt with these incredibly powerfully debilitating physical issues, it's gonna amplify it without a doubt. And Mary had to cope with that. Now again, another incredible thing about this young girl at the time, she was savvy. She got every detail of that monster. She really did. She gave a really, really good description of him to the police. And because of that, literally several members of the public recognized the artist's impression. I mean, that is no mean feat. To be able to describe somebody in such detail that people literally recognize the individual, that demonstrates how sharp she was. It bore an incredible likeness to her attacker. So Singleton is soon identified as their main suspect. You're not gonna believe what this guy is like, genuinely. We talk often about the malevolence of these monsters. We know about their Machiavellian, psychopathic, narcissistic type brains and attitudes to people. But this is an individual who may not be, shall we say, somebody with a body count as big as Dharma, but the evil that runs through this human's veins is so despicable and dark that it's almost hard to distinguish him from any of the big serial killers. Because often when people kill, it's because they get apprehended that they don't get to do it again when we're talking about crimes like this. So he gets identified as this suspect. He's really distinctive looking. First of all, he's an incredibly unattractive man. And so that stands out. So in the situation that plays out, it doesn't take long for him to be arrested. It's the 9th of October, 1978. So thankfully, Singleton gets arrested in Sparks, Nevada, and he gets charged with rape, sodomy, oral copulation, kidnapping, mayhem, and attempted murder, which is a good thing, which I don't know, should result in him having his arms removed and being thrown in a canyon and left. But this time, everyone drives past his car. Just an idea. But these are charges that, with respect, can we please be honest about this? She should be dead. He fully intended to kill her. She was tortured. She had her lower arms removed. She has to deal with the most heinous amount of trauma. And clearly this is an individual who will be very angry that she survived. So you can imagine where he is in this moment. And bear in mind that she has absolutely identified him. There is no way, shape or form that this man is not the guy who she without a doubt wants to bring to justice because why would you want to bring anybody else to justice? But he gets charged and pleads not guilty. Of course he is. Not guilty to any of the charges. Anyway, they don't believe him, which is a very good thing. They go and search his property and they find Mary's cigarettes. They find remnants of uh, burnt clothing as well. So directly linking him to the actual crime. And the media do what they always do. They dubbed Singleton the Mad Chopper. But I really don't like the infamy that they give these kind of excuses for humans. So then we get to the trial in San Diego in March 1979. Bear in mind, we're not getting to a point where it's like, I'm going to make a plea deal. Going to make a plea deal? No. He's going to see it through. So this is five months after the attack. Mary, who's been through this hideous experience, she just stands bravely in court. I mean, she has got the soul of a lioness, hasn't she? And she testifies against him. She says, that's my attacker. And as she's leaving the room, can you believe this? Singleton apparently whispered to her, I say apparently, but I think we can all agree that this is certainly what we'd expect from this human being. He says, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. Now in court, Singleton does actually admit that he met Mary, but he denies harming her. He says that she was a weed smoking sex worker, referred to her as a $10 a night whore, claimed that actually he was the victim. I'm the victim. It's me. It's all about me. I'm the victim. Yeah, apparently she accused him with a stick 
and threatened to accuse him of rape if he didn't drive her to LA. Now we understand there's a half truth there because there was certainly a moment where she let him know that if he dared to touch her, she had a stick in her hand and it was probably gonna end up inserted somewhere like we wish it had been. But using that half truth, it means that probably the way that he came across was a little bit believable to those defending him than it would have been if there hadn't been any scenario where she tried to defend herself in that way. Also, apart from minimising his part in this completely and basically trying to make everybody look at her and question her very nature by saying that she's a sex worker, though God knows why that would ever influence anybody to think less of somebody, but this is the way he plays it. He says that she's had sex with two other hitchhikers that he picked up, Larry and Pedro. Who's that? Larry. Mm. Pedro. I mean, come on. Larry and Pedro. Larry and Pedro who? I don't know. I remember the first names and what they did and giving them a lift, but I don't actually know who they are, where they went, where I dropped them. What's even more weird is that she doesn't seem to remember any of it either. It just seems that she's going for me. One could always imagine that I'm making all of this up and she's just telling the truth. But if you can just find Larry and Pedro, they'll solve all this and just sort it out ASAP. Anyway, apparently Larry and Pedro have sex with her and then she offers him sex too. So he presumes that basically what had happened is this had all occurred, there'd been all of this sexual intimacy and then one of the other hitchhikers just attacked her asleep whilst he was drunk and asleep. So he just basically assumed that the injuries that she received would have been when he was so drunk that he was asleep and he obviously couldn't defend her at that moment in time. There's so many holes in this story, I cannot even begin to start to dissect it in a way I would feel was appropriate. So yeah, he says, I woke up, Larry had been driving, Mary was gone. Just her clothes were in the van. Sorry? Sorry, Mr. Singleton, I'm just going to throw it out there as the prosecution. So what you're saying is there was a parent sex worker, though she's under the age of consent, but we'll come to that maybe with a separate charge, sir. And you've been picking up these hitchhikers, Larry and... Pedro, as you say, you've all kind of hung out with each other under the influence. That might be another charge we can throw in again later there. And consequently, you all have sex with this minor and then you come round. She's not in the car. The guy driving is in the car. The clothes of hers are in the car and you're like, it'll be fine. I mean, should be completely naked in the wilderness. If that isn't normal on a Thursday night, what is? If I don't often go in the wilderness and see young minors just walking around totally naked, what kind of a Thursday night is it? Anyway, fortunately, because the jury had more than 15 brain cells in entirety, he's found guilty on the 29th of March, 1979, on all counts. And this is where the story should end. I should go. He got sentenced to 975 years because, boy, you don't want this kind of human predator walking our streets ever, particularly one who takes no responsibility, no accountability, victim blames, threatens the victim, and then has an opportunity to say, fair cop, apologise, I realise what I've done wrong, but instead minimises their own part and projects blame entirely onto this young woman. Because that makes him super dangerous. What we know about these kind of individuals is they don't actually feel that they've done anything wrong. And if they don't feel they've done anything wrong, then when they go to prison, it's not going to soothe them. It's not going to rehabilitate them because they don't believe that they did anything that needs rehabilitation. It's going to incite rage. It's going to incite hatred. It's going to exacerbate and amplify those feelings that he already has about women. So we're basically putting him away for a period of time. And then if that period of time isn't long enough to supersede those feelings within him to a point where he's either too old, too weak, or he literally gets out when he's carried out in a box, which is the one that I would like to go for, 
then you're going to put somebody on the street who really has graduated in their hostility and evil. So he gets, for that crime that I talked about earlier on, for the horror that this young girl has experienced, he gets 14 years in prison. 14 years. I cannot compute that. Now, that is the maximum sentence permitted under Californian law. Bizarrely, I don't know why. I really don't. I don't see how that is in any way, shape or form conducive to what we're talking about. So he ends up getting incarcerated in California men's colony that's near San Luis Obispo. And even worse, and it is worse, he gets released on parole for good behaviour after serving just eight years. Why don't... You just let him go immediately. The damage that was likely done to him in those eight years is probably so profound that women now are even less safe than they were when you put him in the slammer that he should never be getting out of. Now, he got out for good behaviour, by the way, despite the fact he never showed any remorse or admitted any responsibility for the attack. He still considered himself to be the victim. Now, this is how it should go in a therapy session when you're dealing with somebody coming up for parole. So how are you feeling about the potential of being released? I'm feeling really good about it because, you know, it wasn't my fault. I think that it was really your fault though, wasn't it? Because you've been in prison for a considerable amount of time and we're looking at you getting out it's really important that we understand that you're not a threat or a danger to women anymore. I didn't do anything. I'm completely innocent. It was Larry and Pedro. I need you to be accountable and responsible. I mean it. Or I'm not going to be able to suggest that you get to leave. Maybe ever. It's not my fault. It's all her fault. She was the problem. She should be in here serving time. And actually, in the future, I think I'm going to sue her. Okay, okay, Mr. Singleton, if you just go back to your cell now, I'll write the recommendation. Where's the never released big rubber stamp? Oh, thank you. That's how it should go. That's how it should go. But no, doesn't. No, they just are like, you know what? Good behaviour. Let him out. Simple as that. And also, all the way through prison, he even referred to Mary as that little bitch to the prison psychiatrist. Am I in a coma somewhere? Because genuinely, how does this make any sense? Now, one psychiatrist actually did conclude this. Because he is so out of touch with his hostility and anger, he does remain an elevated threat to others' safety inside and outside of prison. I don't know who was doing the good behaviour thing. I'm imagining they got somebody like Ed Kemper to just make decisions. Maybe on a Saturday to make prison a little bit less prisony, they threw names in a hat and were like, what? It's Singleton's time to go home this week. It does not make sense. Also, just to add to that, whilst he was in prison, I wasn't actually joking when I was saying about wanting to sue Mary. He wrote letters to Mary's lawyer in which he threatened her. And police and prosecutors were genuinely expressing concern that he was going to try to kill her again. And one prosecutor stated this, I think if anything is worse now, amen to that. Good, good, good prosecutor. Good prosecutor. Prosecutor knows what they're doing. Right. Absolutely right what they're saying there. So they say, he's not taking any responsibility. He lives in a bizarre fantasy land and acquits himself each day. He doesn't accept his guilt and he won't resolve never to do it again. And tragically, that prosecutor was going to be proven right. And that to me is a diabolical failure in a system. When you have the police and prosecutors jumping up and down, psychiatrists writing and saying, this guy is not safe. He's going to be a danger to women when he's blaming the victim right into the lawyer and threatening her. And believe me, it carries on where Mary is concerned shortly. I wasn't joking regarding the litigious threats towards her. But we're talking about what happens when due diligence doesn't occur, where good behaviour is laughable, and where women's lives 
appear so minimal that it takes your breath away. Now, meanwhile, we have Mary, of course, who's been absolutely profoundly left in fear of Singleton. She thinks, yeah, this guy could well make good on his promise to kill me. She was so traumatized, she was so depressed. Imagine having to cope with the physical, the psychological wounds of the attack, and she really struggled. She really did, as we all would. She had to attend a specialist school because she was now disabled. And also she had to see psychiatrists and other therapists just to try to keep a hand and a hold on how to cope with such absolute agony, both physical, mental, emotional in her life. And to be fair, the psychiatrists and therapists didn't know how to treat her because it's a difficult scenario. They look at her and they want to help her, but to be fair, a lot of psychiatrists and a lot of therapists aren't very good at doing that stuff. And whoever she was being sent to, I don't feel that she was given an appropriate service because some of those practitioners actually said to her it was more difficult for her family to cope than it was for her. I mean, said no, qualified and appropriately trained and satisfactory up therapist or psychiatrist ever. I'm having a really difficult time, are you? Yeah, are you? Yeah, I've got lots of trauma in my background. I've had this horrible physical disability. I'm being kept up with lots of nightmares. I'm scared to leave my home sometimes because this absolute freak of a predator says he's gonna come for me. And my life has changed beyond what I ever experienced and anticipated it could. Yeah, you know, I hear you, but I'm wondering whether you've thought about how this is making your parents feel. I think it's probably making them feel bad, but I don't think it's making them feel worse than me. You see, that's where we differ because I, I think it is worse for them. And they're not getting therapy, so just throwing it out there. You sound a little bit ungrateful. Uh, what? How? I'm, oh, leaving? I'm gonna leave. You know what I mean? How can anybody do that? It's worth for your family than it is for you. Now, it was horrific. A bomb was thrown into the family unit and ultimately it broke it down to some degree because her father, and I get this, I'm fully on board with how he feels. He just became absolutely obsessed with a desire to kill his daughter's attacker. And I completely concur. I know that forgiveness is the way forward. I appreciate it. I've worked with enough people to know how to move forward. But, you know, when you have a connection to that child, it's like a soulful connection. And you can't even imagine somebody harming a hair on the head, let alone what we're talking about in this tragic case. I imagine that he imagined a million times what he would do to ensure of that man's demise. But that fixation and obsession, it creates a cancer within the family. And ultimately he and his wife separate. And also Mary leaves home. As soon as she's old enough, she gets out. She lives a reclusive, secluded life for many, many years. And the reason for that is she is absolutely convinced that there are gonna be some more repercussions. It gets so serious that she develops an eating disorder, literally just doesn't go out. In those years that followed, something that she was not responsible for, something that she should have been helped and guided through, she even struggled to maintain close relationships. And yet, that bastard, he got released from prison. Didn't have to apologize, accept responsibility, no. Just could get on with his life, start anew. She was the one that was left serving that sentence, a far, far longer sentence, a far more difficult sentence than he could ever have contemplated. She even contemplated taking her own life on numerous occasions. And she actually later stated, I chicken out. And a part of me would feel like, I can't even do that, right? But she later had a son, Luke. And that son, it helped bring a sense of meaning to her life. And I think that's beautiful. Again, it doesn't surprise me. We're talking about a warrior. This woman is a warrior. 
I imagine that she's bestowed such traits in her child as well. But she never got over her attack. And she also feared, and understandably feared, for her son's safety. Although I doubt for one minute that she'd have to be fearful if he were to touch her son. I think that Singleton would be the one hoping to God that she didn't catch him. Because we know that she's got a spirit that's very feisty, resilient and powerful. And I doubt that he'd get away from that pointed stick ever again. Oh, how I wish she had been given half an hour in a room with a few pointed sticks. Maybe with her dad, with a few other pointed sticks. Again, I'm not queen of the world. I'm not a judge. But sometimes I do feel that justice would be better served in such ways. You know, like the old eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of stuff. I know it's not appropriate. I'm just saying it evokes something in me. So following Singleton's release, that should never have happened, we can all agree on that, he does struggle to find a place to settle because I don't know, local communities are deeply sensitive. I'm not concerned when these kind of sexual predators who don't actually care about their victims and take no responsibility for their actions just arrive where they are. Yes, hopefully there were pitchforks when he was chased out of those communities. Genuinely, he was hounded out of town. I am imagining it like some kind of Disney film, like in Beauty and the Beast, where the locals turn up armed with candles and pitchforks. Nonetheless, I'm not sure that's how it happened. I'm just saying that's how it happened in my head. So it's very difficult for him to find anywhere to live because nobody wants him. And he ends up living in a trailer for several years on the grounds of San Quentin Prison in California. Why? I'm sorry. No. That should not happen. You make your bed, you lie in it. You make your bed, you lie in it. At the end of the day, he made his bed. You don't get to go and be on the grounds of the prison because no one wants you around. They should have kicked him off permanently. And if he'd refused to go, maybe get those locals with the pitchforks and the fire. Anyway, he stays there, in fact, for the remainder of his parole. And of course, what's he saying and doing? All that time where he's protesting his innocence. Protesting his innocence. And I said earlier, there was a more astonishing moment to what happened with Mary. He files a complaint against her. Can you believe that? He files a complaint against her. So this is evidence again of absolute utter denial of what he's done. They should have carted him back to prison at that moment in time. And he accuses her of forcible kidnap for the purposes of robbery. I kid you not. I kid you not. This man literally tried to have her charged because he wanted to turn on its head the reality and nature of what went on. Apparently he said that he felt sympathy for her, but he wanted to clear his name. Thankfully, his complaint got absolutely nowhere. Can only imagine how it was, you know, when the district attorney saw it. Let's have a look. Oh, what is it? Oh, you're not going to believe who this is. No, oh, um, it's, uh, it's Mr. Singleton. Wait a minute. You mean the Singleton guy who we chased out? Uh, sorry, um, the Singleton guy who the local community chased out of town. Yeah, yeah, he got chased out of several towns. Yeah, I organised it. Um, the, I organised how he could move on to the grounds of the prison. Oh, yeah, 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 that's, that was a good idea. Yeah, I wanted him back in prison. I mean, I wanted him to find a place where he could be close to prison safety. Yeah, well, anyway, he's written, seems like you know a lot about Mr Singleton. No, 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 I don't, don't know a lot about him. I don't know a lot about him. It's just... Uh, Apparently that trailer is a lot more difficult to set fire to though. Not that I know any of those things. Anyway, tell me what you were going to tell me. So yeah, Singleton's saying that he wants to have Mary charged. What? Yeah, he wants to have Mary charged because he says that she forcibly kidnapped him. And he feels sorry for her, but he still wants her charged. Have you got any ideas? Um, just going to make a few calls. By the way, you know that pitchfork that I lent you for your, for your garden? Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you want the, uh, the hooded cloaks as well? Um, 
Yeah, I don't mean that. Just ignore me. I don't hooded clothes. What am I on about? Anyway, yeah, you sort that out. Honestly, that's how it would be in my dream sequence. Not suggested that um, district and state attorneys would involve themselves in things like that. Literally, cloaks and daggers. Or cloaks and pitchforks, maybe. Anyway, it gets nowhere. Like, the public are rightly outraged against this man. The righteous rage and indignation that they would feel for such absolute lies must have boiled the blood of everyone. Absolutely. Now, Mary did go on to win a 2.56 million civil judgment against Singleton, but it means nothing. She got nothing. He was unemployed. He only had $200 in his savings. So it's kind of irrelevant when they do things like that. I mean, she deserved money without a doubt. Her life had been absolutely ruined in so many ways. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that her life in every way was ruined. I'm saying for a period of time, it was stolen from her. What comes from that is a seed of power. We never have to lose sight of that with Mary. There's a seed of power, but it takes time to cultivate and grow and certainly is spurred on when her son's born. From what I understand and what I've read about her at least. Now, following completion of his probation period, that ends in April 1988, he moves back to Florida. So he settles in Tampa. And in 1990, he actually gets arrested for petty theft. Twice. Again, why are we not carting him back to prison? Now, in court, what he does is he says to the judge, Oh, I'm really sorry. I'm just a confused, muddle-headed old man. Honestly, that's what he said. Now, in truth, we all know he's a dangerous sexual predator waiting for an opportunity to strike. And he did get sentenced to two years, but it's nothing. He's out. He's back on the streets in absolutely no time. Now, at this point, it's nearly 20 years after attempting to kill Mary Vincent. Nearly 20 years. And yet Singleton isn't finished. He strikes again. In 1997, we have 31-year-old Roxanne Hayes. She's a mother of three. A mother of three. She's living in Tampa. She was in a relationship with a really long-time boyfriend, Clifford Tyson. Now, Roxanne, when I did my research, it is clear that she had a tough upbringing. She did. She had a tough life. She was the youngest of five kids, and as a child, she'd dealt with really hideous trauma. She'd been sexually abused by a grandfather, and that was from the age of two. What's worse is the family knew it, and they just let it continue. When she was aged around six, her granddad was actually found dead in her room. That's the only good part of that story. To some degree, I wish he'd been found dead in her room I don't know, with some antifreeze near him and her stood there looking innocent and just shaking her head. I don't know how this happened. I don't know how this happened. Because the fact that this child was two years of age and being molested by somebody that was meant to be a carer for her is just profoundly disgraceful. Now, after his death, her own father, he's an abusive drunk, so great. He just carries on the abuse. He carried on abusing his daughter until she was 14 years of age. And it's not as if she just walks away from that life because she's found a better option. Her mother dies. So now she's got that on top of all of the things I've just talked about, the compounding trauma, trauma, trauma. And it's at this point she leaves home. You can imagine the fractures, the foundational breaks in this child's psyche. Who can you trust? You can't trust your mother, your father, your grandfather. You're just abandoned in so many ways, emotionally, psychologically, physically. You have to look after yourself. As a teenager, she was actually ostracized because she was big, she was. She was over six foot tall. She was 380 pounds, so that's 27 stone, if you live in the UK. And that's big. You know, you're gonna stand out. And boys weren't interested in her and she genuinely had no friends. So she ends up leaving school literally as soon as she can. And then she ends up in a series of relationships with men. And basically she was used by all of them. I appreciate that we're living in a time where fat positivity is fashionable. And I appreciate that absolutely no human being should be judged 
for their size, but it doesn't play out in reality. We can pretend that the Lizzo's of this world are really celebrated because they're a certain plus size, but if you're gonna do that, you're then negating the reality of what so many plus size people have to endure. Most aren't celebrated. Most are attacked and abused and hurt. And I think it's amazing when people can totally own their bodies, whatever size they are, wow, whatever size they are. But the idea that it's not tougher and the idea that it's simple as just walking around more and eating less, as if that were the antidote. Of course, we know these realities, but that's not why food plays such an important part in people like this woman's life. Because when you are in the most horrific abusive situation, and I've worked with many people who are traumatized in childhood, particularly sexual abuse, and they become obese, and part of it is to try to make themselves less attractive physically towards their abuser. It doesn't work. And they're not even necessarily conscious of that. But it's a way of building layers to kind of put distance between them and the abuser. And then of course, after that stops, it's the comfort. How do I fill this void that this abuse has crippled me with and so on and so forth. So she's been through all of this and the way that she's weaponized food against herself, but also potentially is that protective mechanism to prevent people getting too close. And yet she then finds herself being used by other men time and time again. The conflict with her self-esteem, her lack of confidence, the desire to be wanted and cared for, only to be violated and abandoned. This is all going on in this woman's mind and heart. When she leaves school, she obviously wants to escape because of all that bullying. And as I said, she gets used by them. But then she, on top of this, develops a cocaine addiction. Now, the thing about cocaine is it suppresses your appetite. So she goes from being this really large woman to literally losing half of her body weight. She pretty much halves in size. Now, on one level, you can say, well, maybe that would make it more simple for her to be accepted by a society that should know how to accept people anyway, no matter their size. But what it also does is it additionalizes the reality of her vulnerability. Now she needs to support that addiction. She probably is looking at herself physically and thinking people are more attracted to me now. And when you have attachment and abandonment issues, you want people to validate you. It's normal. It's normal for all of us to want validation, but most of us have got a secure place to go for it. But she hasn't. So now she uses prostitution to fund her addiction. During that following decade, she ends up getting arrested countless times, as you'd imagine. It's for drugs, it's for prostitution offenses. She's an easy picking, isn't she? Genuinely. I mean, she's a drug dependent. She's not turning tricks for fun. She's doing it to cope. She's doing it to medicate that horrific childhood. Roxanne went on to have three children. Actually, the first was from a really early relationship just after leaving school. But the second two were with her long-term boyfriend, Clifford. Now, yes, I do not doubt or deny she had her personal issues. So she was a drug addict, she was a sex worker. But let me tell you, that woman was an absolutely doting mother. Doting. Compassion running through her veins, committed to those children. She'd read to them every night. She'd treat them whenever she could. She went to the school performances, she supported her children's educational development. And you can imagine with all of that stuff that's gone on for her and with the dependency issue, the fact that still she's placing those kids' feelings first, to balance that is almost impossible. It's very rare I hear that, that somebody can be so dependent and yet still completely focused on what's most important to her kids. She was just trapped in this awful, endless, vicious cycle. And the problem for that is that she couldn't secure her regular work because of her criminal record. Why do we criminalize sex workers, for God's sake? Why do we criminalize people who get high on drugs? Why? Why are they criminals it, doing it to their own body? It's their own body. That's it. 
We don't have a right to then make it even more difficult to just get a job, get clean, thrive by criminalizing them. We criminalize women who sell their bodies and men who sell their bodies. Why? Why? What harm does that do to the next person? They need protection. My gosh, we should certainly protect them. But the idea that we just steal opportunities because we create these statistics of success in bringing these individuals to justice that don't even need bringing to justice. It's hard to know that she was looking for regular work, but she was always forced to return to sex work to support her family. Now, this situation actually gets worse in 1996. So Clifford, a long-term partner, he's injured in a car accident, and that means he can't even work after this. And Roxanne, therefore, is the sole provider. She has absolutely no choice as far as she's concerned. She sells her body or she can't look after her children. She can't look after her partner. It's also worth noting that this woman hated doing it. She hated it. And I think that people can judge partners who are in relationships with people who are sex workers and say, well, why didn't they stop them? Or why didn't they stop the addiction? First off, it's really difficult to stop anybody's addiction unless they want to do it and have the capacity and resources to make it happen. Number two, sex work is not a disgusting, despicable lifestyle. It is what somebody chooses to do. And for a period of time, many people who get involved in sex work actually don't despise it it tends to be something that becomes more of a position of that as they go along doing it. I think particularly in this case, she probably always hated doing it, but I don't think that he was forcing or coercing her to do something. I think it was simply down to economics and finances. She needed to bring in the cash. And even though she didn't enjoy it in any way, shape or form, at least they were fed, at least they were warm and she wanted her children to be safe. We get to the 19th of February, 1997. We'll never, to be fair, know what the circumstances were that caused Roxanne's path to cross with a 69-year-old singleton. That's, that's right, 69. Bear in mind, we actually see a massive drop-off in violent offending after 50 because people get too old or too bored or too weak or they grow out of a desire to ever be incarcerated again. So even in the most violent of offenders, you don't expect to see 69 year olds doing things that cause others death in violent sexual ways. So he manages to lure her into his home. This is in Sulphur Springs in Tampa. And according to Singleton, who we can take with a massive pinch of salt. Let's not believe anything he says, but let me tell you what he says. He met Roxanne several months earlier. But that day, in that February, he basically consumed a lot of prescription medication, antihistamines and alcohol. And he picks her up, wants her to come home with him because he wants oral sex. He pays her $20, in fact, for oral sex. The same day, Paul Hitson, he's been hired at this point to paint Singleton's house. He walks into the property and... I kid you not that I nearly fell off my chair when I was researching this. I kid you not. I was so infuriated. He walks in to that property and he hears a muffled cry for help. And in the front room, he literally sees Singleton hunched over a woman on a couch. Now, I don't know whether I'm being unfair, but if I heard somebody cry for help and see a man hunched over a woman on a couch, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little bit of an unusual character. Maybe I'm one of those human beings that doesn't act in accordance with, I don't know, common sense and reality as others would see it. Because if I, using my own common sense and reality and logic, were to hear a woman asking for help and there was this man hunched over her, I'd go and help. Anyway, he doesn't. Just goes back outside, tells his uncle what he'd seen. Then, he's obviously interested to know whether something else is going on, he goes back, he looks through the window of the front door 
and he sees Roxanne literally lying on the couch. She's not moving. And then Singleton is standing over with his hand around her neck. And then he witnesses Singleton make three downward pounding motions on Hay's chest and neck. And he also says that he heard bone crunching sounds. He said like chicken bones breaking. It's at this point that they actually go and ring the police and ask for help. And I know, of course, I'm not blaming that guy. I'm just saying that's a really weird thing to do. Roxanne is in mortal danger and you're just watching and listening to bone crushing sounds. I'm sorry, I just can't compute. You should have ran in. I don't know. Used whatever he was hitting her with to, shall we say, at least make him succumb to your power and then get her help. He phones the police, the police turn up and what do they find? Well, they find Singleton with his shirt undone. He's drunk. He's literally covered in blood and on the floor lies Roxanne. She's naked. She's blooded and her body was covered in stab wounds. She'd been stabbed deeply seven times. She'd been stabbed in the face, in the chest, in the stomach. And she had a seven inch wound straight through her liver to her spine. It'd later be established that the fatal wound had actually been penetrated through the right ventricle of her heart and that meant that she bled to death. And Roxanne also had some really deep lacerations and defensive wounds on her hands. She'd really tried to fight. She'd actually almost had a index finger, a middle finger on her left hand almost severed. They believe that she would have been alive for about four to five minutes after she was attacked. So she'd have been conscious after that fatal wound to the heart, which is just utterly horrific to conceptualize. Now, when the police arrived, as I said, they see him in this state and he's actually at the time that they come in the process of dragging Roxanne's body through the house towards his van. And of course, it, that moment is arrested and charged with first degree murder. But bear in mind, this is not a murder that should have ever taken place. Because this guy has form, never said sorry, carried on offending, maybe even offended more than we know. We get to Singleton's trial. It takes place in Tampa, Florida in February 1998. Incredibly, stays true to form, blames the victim for her own death. Yeah, just, this is unbelievable. Unbelievable. He says that Roxanne had attempted to steal his wallet and when he stopped her, oh, she became enraged. She grabbed the boning knife that was conveniently on a nearby table, which he claimed he used to cut vegetables whilst watching TV with, and that she literally tried to decapitate him. You know, he didn't have a scratch on his neck but yeah apparently she's so effective at trying to decapitate him that he doesn't even get a mark also at this point he says this is a reason why i acted in self-defense so then he says he struggled with her for about 30 seconds and each time he pulled her arm downward to pry the knife from her apparently she managed to stab herself yeah ultimately she inadvertently stabbed herself seven times. I mean, what do we do with an individual like this man? Answers on a postcard. I imagine the answer will be brief. Singleton also claimed that he didn't even realise that Roxanne was injured. The first thing he knew about it was when he saw her dying on the floor. Apparently she didn't even make a noise, even though, you know, the guy who was just walking in because of the fact that he'd been painting the house, he said that somebody specifically had a muffled cry for help. No, no, he didn't hear that. Didn't hear that at all. And this is the pièce de résistance of this absolute pillock. And that's a very nice word to use for the one that I really wish it to insert regarding Singleton. As she lay dying, he said, she put both her arms around me and asked me to hold her. So I held her tight. We were embracing. I do not know 
where Singleton's brain exists, but it must be in a galaxy far, far away, and one that none of us will ever be able to visit, nor would wish to. He then adds insult to injury with this bizarre and ridiculous story. He says, oh, I meant to call 999, but I accidentally picked up the TV controller. Hello, is that 999? Is that 999? Why is that cooking program on? Is that 999? Is that four in a bed? Do you know what I mean? I don't even want to swear. I don't want to swear, but I want to swear. The point is, he's absolutely BSing it. So then his excuse is, because the TV controller didn't work, because he's calling it, he tries to get to the car, but then his knee gives out. So all of this is happening, and at that point, he just sits and cries, and he rubs her face as she died. Ugh! Do you think in court there'll ever be an opportunity where people can just throw random objects that they've managed to get through security at the individual perpetrator. You know, if it's an absolute clear-cut case where there's no way it wasn't them, is that possible? I know you wouldn't be able to bring very large items, but, I don't know, a pair of heavy clogs or some very sharp stilettos. Even the judge could do it. That hammer that they use, just aim it at his forehead. Anyway, of course, when they look at her body autopsy, it tells a completely different story. So first of all, the angle of the stab wounds distinctly remove themselves from what his story is. So it indicates that Roxanne had been stabbed whilst her attacker was literally standing over her. Now, unsurprisingly, the prosecutor, who we'd have all liked to be in this case, he just mocked his claims. He said, if you're to believe Lauren Singleton's testimony, the only crime he committed was assisting suicide. Amen to that prosecutor is right. Now I can't quite believe it, but despite Singleton's incredibly compelling and plausible version of events, the jury took less than four hours to find him guilty of first degree murder. When he got the verdict, he showed absolutely no reaction. I mean, I think that gives you insight to this man's heart. He doesn't have one. And what is there instead is a smouldering piece of black coal, literally, which is helpful because it will enable him to ignite more quickly once the devil gets his hands on him. Just throwing it out there. And can you imagine the fact that what we're talking about here is a mother of three and her partner would have had to listen to all of that testimony, to that man deriding his partner, to that man suggesting that she was the one who ultimately caused her own death, to that man suggesting that she was trying to steal from him, all the while knowing that he executed her. Can you imagine how you'd feel? Honestly, I bet there was a massive part of him that wanted to get on the phone to Mary's father and be like, you know what, mate, we're having very similar feelings about this, so maybe together we could, I don't know, deal with a bit of justice that might not be seen as appropriate, but that will certainly make us and the rest of society feel better. Because Roxanne, wow, how he derided her and how the defence derided her too. Now, Mary Vincent, so that's, of course, Singleton's previous victim, she travelled all the way across the country to see her attacker face to face for a second time. Oh, my God, she took that power back. She gave evidence at the sentencing phase. She said to the court about all the devastating impact his actions had had on her life. She let him know, you may have harmed me, you may have hurt me, but I'm going to stand in front of you now, I'm going to watch you be put down, I'm going to watch you and you're going to know that I'm part of that story. You're going to know that I am part of why you were losing your freedom. And I hope to God that was an empowering moment for her. Now, ultimately, Singleton was sentenced to death by electric chair. Now, following Roxanne's beyond brutal murder, one of the things that her family were devastated by, and her friends were devastated by, was the fact that the media portrayed her in a way that they portrayed her. So they portrayed this loving mother and partner and friend as a drug-addicted prostitute and thief. Yeah. 
Those bastards didn't put her out there in the way that she should have been known. They didn't have her as the innocent individual whose life was snuffed out by this human predator, this serial killer. Instead, they used a tiny aspect of who she was and amplified that message so that everyone looking in would see Roxanne not as a victim, but as an individual who invited her own demise. And that's disgusting. She was a loving mother of three. She was trying to support her family. She was trying to support her boyfriend who'd been injured. Clifford, her partner, stated this. On the news, they say Lauren Singleton was in court for killing a prostitute. They don't say Mr. Crazy was in court or Mr. Monster was in court. She had a name. Roxanne Hayes. Why not? Lawrence Singleton was in court for killing Roxanne Hayes. And even though we weren't there to write those things, to correct and remedy those horrible headlines, at least today, we can all remember that. Roxanne Hayes was murdered by Lawrence Singleton. And Lawrence Singleton was in court for killing Roxanne Hayes for murdering a mother of three, for taking a much loved partner from a man that she supported. And that's how it should have been portrayed. I often think that when people are sex workers, it's almost as if society wants to believe that it could never happen to us, it could only happen to them. It makes people feel safe, but it's a misguided belief and it denies the impact and meaning of these human beings who have their lives stolen. Ultimately, Singleton managed to somehow escape the justice that he deserved because just three years after his conviction, he died of cancer. That was in December 2001. It's a real shame he didn't die of cancer about 30 years earlier, isn't it? And I appreciate cancer's a horrific thing. And for decent human beings, Nobody deserves that affliction. But he was a cancer in our society and my God, he needed cutting out. He's truly a despicable piece of crap. Ugly. Inside. Ugly. Out. Now, despite the fact that Singleton was only ever convicted of one murder, understandably the authorities believe that he's probably a serial killer who just evaded justice for years. He was a ruthless sexual predator. He wanted to use extreme violence all about satisfying his own warped, disgusting, depraved desires. The thing about him is that in spite of the fact that he did kill one woman and maybe more, he didn't kill Mary Vincent's spirit. I mean, he tried, but he didn't succeed. She went on to become an advocate for victims of crime. She wanted to tell trauma victims what it took her 20 years to learn. She said, you'll never get over it but you can get past it. As an adult, she actually found escapism in art and she apparently never had any talent for that before the attack, but she said the attack itself somehow awoke the artists within her and it inspired her and gave her real self-esteem and she's gone on to become a really accomplished artist, but she has been a person who, in spite of this incredible talent and success, she's always avoided the spotlight. And I imagine part of that is because she probably felt in the spotlight for a very long time because of the horrible, illuminated experience of being a victim of Singleton. Now, while Singleton's death didn't give her any satisfaction, she was at least really happy to see the relief on her kids' faces. I mean, Imagine that. Imagine knowing that when you tell them he's dead, they feel relieved because you know that they've been holding that in. They've been holding in that fear. So they were glad. I don't know. Let's throw a party. The singleton's dead. I'll bring cake. What are you bringing? Honestly, people like this deserve parties thrown when they die. You know, this is a real tragedy that she's had to live her life with. 
She's had the physical scars that have been inflicted by a monster. And that tragedy is compounded by the fact that that same monster was allowed to walk free and then to destroy not only another innocent life, to steal a mother from her children, to steal a friend from all those who loved her, to steal a partner from Clifford. And that didn't need to happen. Roxanne did not need to die. And that is a grave error on the authorities' parts. Not the police, not the prosecutor. They wanted him in. But those who let him walk free. There's one thing I'll say before I end today's video, and that's at least Singleton's dead now. Because the world is a better place for it. And I hope where he's burning in hell, he's burning slowly and hot for the rest of eternity. Thank you for joining me. Like I said, it's an astonishing case, this. The gravity and the terror and the brutality that this man impacted on his victims is beyond real comprehension. But more than that, I without a doubt believe that he killed many more women. Many more women. He had his MO. He knew what he was doing. And he got away with it. And that, like I said, is something that lays heavy in my mind and heart. Let me know your thoughts on this. Let me know whether you too feel that frustration. If you've enjoyed this video, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Please come back. I always do live chats. It's really lovely to connect with you guys in my community. And my community is full of the best human beings that I could ever express to you. I don't think it happens in a lot of places online, but it certainly happens in my community. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you massively. And let's take a moment to remember Roxanne and also to celebrate Mary. Be safe.